Um, and we'll just sort of see what happens today given the weather. But we are at 9 o'clock, and as always, we have a lot to cover. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and get started. I tried to get Brother Langy here this morning. Who? Langy, Roy Langy's son. Oh, okay. He was at the college board meeting yesterday. But he has to go back to Alabama. I, I wanted him to hear what you had to say about it. Or at least get that copy that you had. I'll let you get started. All right. All right. All right. Start whenever you want. All right, so it's uh, good to see everybody this morning. And um, we are looking at Lesson 124, The Life and Ministry of C. Richard Jordan, The Formation of Gray School of Bible. It's a topic for today. So a couple points by way of introduction, and then we'll uh, look, get uh, right into what we're going to be looking at here. So introduction, in our last study we looked at Richard's decision to move from Alabama to Chicago to work for Stam at the Brain Bible Society, as well as the events surrounding the formation of Shorewood Bible Church. So those are the, the things that we caught, topics we covered last Sunday in this uh, section of the class related to the history of, of uh, Richard and his ministry. So point number two, in this lesson we want to consider how Grace School of Bible came into existence. And in addition, we'll, be, we'll begin looking at how the Grace Alternative Doctrines came to be understood. So again, I'm going to put this in every one of these lessons just so everybody knows. Um, the majority of the contents for this lesson, again, were taken from the personal interview that I conducted with Richard at my home in uh, June of 2013. The reason I'm, the reason I'm doing that is, you know, it's, I don't know who's going to pick these up and what sequence they might be looking at them, so it's just important to say and have that in print that that's uh, where the material came from, or at least by March. So the, the first topic this morning is, in this second segment, is... The pastoral training class, or Grace School of Bible. Okay, the pastoral training class, or Grace School of Bible. So, Richard had done some traveling prior to 1983, but began his traveling preaching ministry in earnest in that year. It was when Oscar Woodall, who prompted Jordan to begin a series of regional Bible conference, or regional conf Bible conference meetings around the country. These meetings were then promoted in the Brain Search Lab. So the idea here was that to establish some regional meetings, one in Florida, uh, California, uh, other parts of the country, uh, they, they established these weekend regional meetings in addition to the big summer conference, the Cedar Lake Conference that the Brian Bible Fellowship held every year in Indiana. So these, these meetings, Oscar Woodall, uh, we might know who that is, uh, probably a lot of you might not, he was a former businessman who was very good at uh, organizing. And he got with Richard and they organized these meetings and they promoted them in the searchlight and the people would show up for these weekend long Bible conferences and so forth. So that's, that, that begins, these regional meetings begin roughly in the year 1983. Uh, I just want to add to that, it's at that point that he goes out and begins teaching his understanding of right division via the chart stuff that we talked about last Sunday in a, in a sort of wider scale. Uh, remember last Sunday we, I gave you a little history of the chart, uh, the, the trifold chart, how that came to be and so on. So 1983 this is going on. Okay. Meanwhile after attending Shorewood for a while in early 1983 Chuck Wilshire and separately Ted Fellows around the same time approached Jordan about training them for the ministry. Uh, when Richard was telling me about this, basically Chuck and Ted came to him separately and said, whatever you did, we want you to do for us. So they wanted, they wanted him to sort of duplicate for them whatever the process it was that he went through uh, that they saw at work in him. So before Jordan would agree to do so, he had to get permission from Stan. Because remember, in 83, he's still working with and for Stan. Stan agreed as long as they held the classes at the Bible Society. So the classes, Stan says, yes, you can do it, but you got to hold at least some of these meetings at the, uh, the offices at the Bible Society there uh, in Chicago. So Jordan agreed to meet with Wilcher and Fellows at the Spring Bible Conference in Genoa City, Wisconsin, to further discuss the match problem. Um, which, by the way, that church in Genoa City, that's where my dad is currently the pastor, for those of you that might not know that. Um, so they were having a spring meeting there, one of these weekend meetings, and he said, look, 
I'll meet you there. You guys think about it. I'll think about it. We'll discuss it further at the meeting in Genoa City. By the start of the conference in Genoa City in the spring of 1983, the group of men interested in being trained had increased. Given all the time it would take away from his family, Jordan required a firm on their oath three-year commitment that they would see it through to the end. So basically what he says to him was, look, I'll do this, but I want you to basically swear in blood, as it were, that you're going to be here and you're going you're gonna to do this because it's going to take away exorbitant amounts of time from my family and, and from other things for me to be able to do this. And so that's, that's where the idea came from. Yeah. Jordan mentioned if he was charging. He wasn't going to. These guys were not going to be charged money to do this. Okay. Um, he was. He was going to do it just to do it because uh, they 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 wanted it. And you know, Stan at least gave it a cursory okay. And so he decides that if they're going to commit to it, that he thought it was worthwhile enough to do it. Okay. Now understand. At this point, there is no intention of videoing it. Uh, VCRs and video recording equipment in the early 80s, 1983, are just coming, you know, into popular usage. I mean, you remember those first VCRs; those things were massive, okay. And so, Richard, when it, when the idea is is agreed upon in April of '83, that in September they're going to start the first class, there's no even there's not even any inkling at the time to video it or anything like that. So let's look at the next point. What became known as simply as the class, that was what it was first referred to as, and later the pastoral training class, or PTC, before it was called Grace School of the Bible, began to be filmed in September 1983. Through his contacts at the Brea Bible Society, Richard had came to know Alan and Nancy Leach. In 1981, the Leaches started the tape ministry for the Brea Bible Society called Brea Lighthouse Tapes. That was distributing about, and at the time they had been distributing somewhere between ten to twelve thousand audio tapes a year via the uh, Brain Lighthouse Tapes Ministry. I have I have some books at home that my dad gave me that have receipts in them to shove like shoved in as bookmarks that say Brain Lighthouse Tapes at the top from stuff that he had ordered um, during the during the eighties from from that ministry. So. Richard knows the leeches, they are working with the Bible Society, they're distributing the, the, the tapes for the tape ministry and so on. And it was Alan Leach who sent Jordan a video recorder and told him to video the PTC. So basically what happens is Alan Leach spends all this money, buys the equipment, ships it to Richard, says the equipment's coming and you're going to use it to video the classes. So the idea of videoing the classes was never even part of the initial plan when they, when they agreed upon it in the spring of 83. Throughout the summer, the stuff, Leach, the Leach has shipped this equipment to Richard and says, you're going you're gonna to film it. The first cameraman was Richard's oldest son, Rick, Jr. Uh, Rick Jordan Jr. They call him Rick Jr., basically. Um, and if you, the early tapes are, are bad. I'm just going to be honest. They're terrible. Like, you get a shot of the ceiling for 20 minutes. <laughs> I mean, these guys are literally learning how to how to work this stuff on the fly. I mean it's it's some some of the some of the stuff is, is not real good when it comes to that. So anyway, as I say it was the leeches who sent Jordan a video recorder and told him to video the PTC. Unknown to Jordan at first, the leeches began to distribute the school tapes to people as far away as the Philippines. So he's videoing them, he's sending them down to them at Green Lighthouse Tapes in Florida. They're copying and duplicating these things, both audio and video, and just sending them out to people as part of the Brain Lighthouse Tapes Ministry. Okay? Uh, later on in the conversation, the last sentence in that point, uh, Jordan said that years later, with the first time he went to the Philippines, he's sitting in a guy's house, and he looks over, and, and underneath the coffee table, there's an album of the tapes from the Romans class from Grace School of the Bible sitting under this guy's coffee table. And apparently, the leeches had sent this stuff to some people in the Philippines, and they had circulated through some of the with some of the men in ministries there in the Philippines, so that when Richard show, showed up there um, with Dan Gross and some other men, they had already they had already been exposed to some of that basic teaching from the Book of Romans because they had had copies of 
the school tapes uh, sent to them at some point in the 80s by the Legion. So again, there's other people here that have vision behind what Richard's doing that he didn't necessarily have himself when it started. Um, so during 1983-84, as Jordan was traveling around the country at these regional meetings I described, eight different men came to him and told him that they wanted to preach and desired to be trained as well. Jordan's prayer was for the Lord to send some preachers that could deliver the goods. Um, <laughs> he tells a story about sitting at the Cedar Lake Conference the first year in 1979 and listening to the, the, uh, the, the men preach and saying that most of them bored him to tears and saying that he, you know, he, he wanted, he said, Lord, what we need is some preachers that are, he said, they're preaching what I believe. But I'd rather watch paint dry and listen to him do, him do it. And he said that his desire was always for men who would have the desire to preach the word as uh, be, be involved in things. So consequently, when Jordan started Grace School of Bible, a great emphasis was placed upon preaching. From the very beginning of the school, there's an emphasis on the reason we're doing this is so that we can preach the word. So that we can be instant in season, not a season, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. And that's part of the reason for the class. So that there would be some men that could preach and teach the word of God rightly divided. John Verstegen agreed to be the first person to go through the school on video. So John was the video guinea pig. So Richard's going around the country and these men are saying, hey, we want, we want the school, we want the school, we want to be trained. Well, in the meantime, they're videoing this. And so the idea was, okay, well, we'll take John. John was a for, an ex-Marine and very, very committed guy, very sort of dutiful guy. And so Richard theorized, if this guy can do it, then anybody can do it. So he started sending him the class tapes, and he started taking the tests. And John Verstegen, he's out in San, uh, San Juan Capistrano, uh, California. He was the first guy to matriculate through the school using the video and watching it at home take the test, send them in, get them corrected, and he went all the way through, and according to what I've heard reported multiple times, apparently he never missed the, he got them all right the whole, the whole time, um, which if you know John isn't, isn't surprising. Um, so once for Stegen proved that it could be done via video, a schedule was set up, and tapes began being mailed all over the country. So, he proved that it could be done. Once that was there, then they set up a, a rotation system. And initially, Nancy Leach was the one who oversaw the process and got the ball rolling and kept people supplied with videotapes. Eventually, the workload became so strenuous that Jordan had to enlist help with grading papers as well as other aspects of administering the school. Now, you need to understand something here. This is all going on. While he is still working for Stam and pastoring what is now Shorewood Bible Church. So he has his work for Stam, the pastorship of the church, him training these guys in, in, in the ministry, traveling around to these regional meetings, and trying to coordinate all this stuff at the same time. Plus, you know, having a wife and, and kids at home. So th there's a lot of things going on uh, during this time period in his, in his life. So, I guess that's a good place to, any, any questions about any of that? Now some of these names, most of you probably don't know. Um, Ted Fellows, John Verstegen, some of you may have heard those men preach on audio or video or watch them at the conferences on the internet or something like that. But the, the, these guys are still, uh, you know, associated with Richard's ministry and, and come every summer to um, you know preach at the summer Bible conference. Yeah, Mike. Well, where did where where did these men come from? Like Dan Gross and Ted Fellows and this, this is Wisconsin. Gross is from Wisconsin. Uh, Fellows was from Wisconsin. He grew up in the church in Genoa City and Floyd Baker Sr. But were, were they part of the Grace Gospel Fellowship? They were, some some of them like for example. Um, uh, Ted Fellows grew up in, in, in Genoa City, which was historically a BVF church. 
So they had conferences there with so uh, kind of in the GGF, but not really. I would say they're coming from a, a the more I'm coming from, say, BBF, Brea Bible Society circle, than are coming from the GGF, Grace Bible College circle. Which makes sense. Yeah. Which makes sense given the fact that Richard is Stan's right hand man at the time at the Brea Bible Society and is a main speaker at the BBF conference every summer. But they, but they also accept unique doctrines that Richard taught that are not necessarily accepted in the general in the BBF and even the Grace Gospel Fellowship. And I guess that's what I'm getting at is these men seem to be it, kind what, of what you're referring to is what we're going to get to. What, what you're going to get to, right. That stuff is going to be forged out of these men studying together in the school. So when this starts, in other words, when this starts in 83, Richard still held some more traditional views about a couple things, okay? And we'll get to that, those points here in a minute because they are in this set of notes that I want to go through. So when, when John wrote that book, My Journey to Grace, um, he, he was not, did not probably understand a lot of that. At that John Verstegen came out of a Roman Catholic background. Okay. He got saved. He was going to, I believe he may have been going to a GGF type church in California. And for some, through some circumstances, uh, he hears Richard and begins to correspond or have conversation with Richard about different things. And over time, they you know develop a relationship, and eventually John says, "Hey, I want to take the school." Um, hearing some things about John's testimony, John originally, you know, did not agree with Richard about the King James Bible and about a few other things. And you know, over time and through study, he eventually you know comes to you know agree with them about some of those some of those points. Um, Ted Ted grew up in a Grace Church. He grew up in a BBF Church in General City. Um, the rest of the guys, some of them are completely newbies, just save guys that that don't know anything else but Grace preaching, and you know want to know more. So there's a there's a collection of different guys from all different. Backgrounds that are involved in this. Pastor Baker goes clear back to the very origin of the GGF, but then later on, when the tensions increased, why he left the GGF and became very active, and he even became the president, or I guess that's what you call it, the BBF. Yeah. And he was probably, he might have been GGF when he started, but when he was there at that church, I don't remember who the preacher was before Baker, but he had been there for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So yeah, Mike, it's a good question. There's there, there's a lot of there, there's not a singular background that these men are coming from. Um, a few of them grew up in what we would consider to be grace circles, let's put it that way, and others of them are coming to it fresh, without you know, I mean, either out of either a out of some other denominational persuasion or b newly you know recently saved people that have the, uh, I'll just say, the advantage of immediately being hooked up with, you know, mid-acts, Pauline, dispensational teaching, who perceive Richard's manner of presenting it and his depth of knowledge and understanding to be something that they would like, that, that they've identified as, we would like him to train us. That's how this thing gets started. Did I answer your question? Yeah. Yeah, for now. Okay. Yes, yeah. So, um, the curriculum then is based on the Pauline design for the edification of the believer that Richard taught himself in the early 1970s while laboring at the church in Selma, Alabama. What I drew on the board two weeks ago about Romans 8, 8 or sorry, Romans 16, 25, and 26, uh, my gospel, the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery and the scriptures of the prophets, and then the order, the, the canonical order, the Pauline epistles, creating a structure for edification. The school is based on that. The school is not patterned after the standard systematic theology approach that most mainline Bible colleges and institutes follow. So it's an entirely different model and training mechanism than what you would get if you went to say, you know, Grace Bible College, Brain Bible Institute, or any other uh, sort of um, 
any other denominational Bible college or institute. Those, and those of you that have been there, you'll know that or in a situation like that, that they follow what is the systematic approach. And you probably would have to buy systematic theology books. I know a few of you, Fred, you said that when you were at uh, Grand Rapids Baptist, you had to buy Chafer. And the, the approach is more systematic. Richard's approach and the way he structured the school is not, it's purposefully not following that systematic approach, but following this, what he calls the Pauline edification approach. Okay? So offering, offering, quote, Bible edification by extension, the PTC is now known as Grace School of Bible. So, what, so when they originally started, it was just the class. Then it became known as the pastoral training class. Then after Richard uh, separated from Stam, it became what it is now, known as what it is now, Grace School of the Bible. Um, so the published course catalog of Grace School of the Bible states the school's purpose as follows. Okay? So here, this isn't the interview now, this is me quoting from the, 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 the literature. Our main interest is in training men to teach and preach the word rightly divided, with special focus on preaching of Jesus Christ according to the revelation of the mystery. To this end, to this end emphasis is laid on three basic areas. Number one, an intensive study of the English Bible designed to provide a thorough knowledge of the Word of God according to the dispensational methods set forth in 2 Timothy 2.15, thus giving an understanding of what God is doing in this age and preparing the student for useful and effective service for the Lord. Number two, preaching. Rather, preaching rather than on executive and promotional branches and issues of the work. Classroom study plus practical tutelage and on-the-job training and getting the message out to others are combined to balance the student's growth. So there's the emphasis on the preaching aspect. Okay. And third, <clears throat> the Reformation text of the King James Bible rather than on the critical theories that have been used to destroy the authority of that text. The King James Bible is presented as God's word for English-speaking people, and this position will be clearly taught and analyzed both critically and historically. So, students enrolling in Grace School of Bible will complete the following course of study in order, in, in order to be awarded a diploma. Please note that Grace School of Bible is not, a, not an accredited institution of higher learning and does not desire to be. Receiving a diploma from Grace School of Bible would be the equivalent of graduating from an unaccredited Bible Institute program. All right. Now, I, I've duplicated here for you the exact course of study. Okay. So the first year. The first year starts with three trimesters of manuscript evidence. Uh, 101, 102, and 103. An in-depth study of the doctrines of inspiration and preservation of Scripture, followed by the history of the transmission of the biblical text and the production of the English Bible. This, this course gives the students confidence in the authorized version as the English fruit of preservation. Also in the first year would be Romans 101, 102, and 103. The basics of, uh, basics of present truth is provided in a foundational study in grace truth. Following Paul's design, this of course covers the first foundational principle uh, for the edification and establishment of believers in the dispensation of grace. Then you got Daniel 101 and Daniel 102. An overview of the prophetic program is provided by a detailed study of Daniel's basic outline. Fundamentals of Dispensational Bible Study 101 and 102. A practical study of the basic fundamentals of hermeneutics with special emphasis on mid-axe dispensationalism. And then rounding out the first year would be Genesis 102 and 103, a detailed study of the four divine institutions for the establishment and orderly maintenance of the human race as set forth in Genesis 1 through 11, along with an introduction to the Abrahamic, Palestinian, Davidic, and New Covenants. So that's the first year. So if you go through the first year on video, you're going to get all that material in the first year. Second year... Preparation and delivery of sermons, 201, 202, and 203. A practical study of the art of research and development of sermons with emphasis on expositional messages. 
Special interest is paid to, quote, delivering the goods in a clear and plain manner. <laughs> then in the second year, you have Romans 201, 202, and 203, completing, completing a detailed study of Paul's design for edification and establishment by covering the final three foundational principles set forth in Romans. The Galatian and Corinthian epistles are studied in conjunction with this course. Then Matthew... Matt, there's a one trimester of Matthew that you'd start at the end of year one, so that's 103. Then you'd have 201, 202, and 203, a continuation of prophetic studies by focusing on the earthly ministry and message of the Lord Jesus. And finally, Old Testament survey, 201 and 202, a survey of the message and flow of each Old Testament book designed especially to focus on the history of the nation of Israel. So again, you go through year two, you're going to get all that material. Third year, ambassadorship 301 and 302, a pastoral theology surveying the main issues of the work of the ministry. The pastoral epistles are also surveyed in this study. Ephesians 301, 302, and 303, continuing to follow Paul's design for the believer's edification, advanced mystery truth is covered in this detailed study of Ephesians. Colossians and Philippians are studied in conjunction with this course. And finally, Acts 302 and 303. A study of the offer of the kingdom to Israel, the fall of Israel, and subsequent transition to the dispensation of grace. This important transition book is studied in detail. So, I mean, you look at what's there. You, you, have, you have basically three major emphasis. You have, number one, an emphasis on the Bible itself in the manuscript evidence. You have an emphasis on preaching the scriptures, be, you know, developing men that can preach the word. And the third major emphasis is on simply just studying the Bible and, and establishing a base of doctrine and understanding that can be drawn from them for preaching. Richard has a uh, famous illustration that he uses in preparation and delivery and I've stolen this in the past he uses the illustration of a target okay and he says in this I guess I probably technically have too many rings here and I might not be doing this exactly the way he did it but it'll be close enough so out here you have stuff that you don't know okay here you have stuff that you kind of know. And here you have stuff that you know that you ought. Do you know that you know? Alright? So what he says is the more things that you can move from this ring into this ring, and then from this ring into the center ring, what you're doing is you're building a reservoir tank of knowledge that you can then draw from to use when you preach. Okay? Does that make sense? So part of the function of the class is to teach the Bible. Because the main function here is to preach the Bible. The main function here is not psychology, is not counseling, it's not some of the things that we studied that were controversial in the STAM GBC controversy. The main focus, and unapologetically, of Grace School of the Bible is to teach the student the Bible thereby equipping them to preach the Word. That's the main focus. It isn't anything else. We're not trying to make a bunch of, you know, um, psychologists and psychiatrists and, you know, other things. The, the idea here is learn the Scripture, learn how to rightly divide, learn how to defend and accurately analyze and study your Bible so that you can preach the Scriptures. That is the only major goal of Grace School of Bible. Okay? Any questions about that? Norm? Can I ask you personally, how much did that help you taking this course above, above and beyond what you took at the school? Uh -huh. well, let me get to that here in a second, but it's a fair point. Um, can I answer that when I get to it here? Sure. Okay. Sure. Yeah, Mike. So why was it that we, he didn't have an introductory or, or, or and then a developed systematic theology type courses? You know, traditional Bible schools had a Bible doctrine survey of all the doctrines, and then in the following years they would they would have detailed studies of systematic theology. Because his 
his basic approach is that, again, it's that falling design. <coughs> Starting with your salvation and my gospel, moving up to the preaching of Christ according to the revelation of the mystery, and ending in my, my drawings terrible with the scripture of the prophets. So if you look at what he's doing, he's establishing manuscript evidence class is designed to root you in an understanding that you can trust your Bible. Okay? The Romans class is designed to teach you about this. The Ephesians class is designed to teach you about this. And the Daniel, um, Matthew, <coughs> OT survey, uh, what were the other ones? Uh, Acts. Well, Acts. Uh, and Genesis are all designed to show this. In the meantime, then you have fundamentals of dispensational class, which is giving you the, the, the dispensational overview to the entire scripture. So the, the, the idea here is not for you to be able to regurgitate what ten theologians have said about soteriology. The idea here is to understand how Paul says you should be an established believer. That's That's unapologetically the uniqueness of how the school is structured. So that the student will leave not, necess not necessarily knowing what 15 different theologians said about eschatology, but with an understanding of what does the scripture say about these things from the rightly divided mid-Acts framework. So that his main focus is not for them to know the theologians, it is for them to know the Bible. Not, not Mike though saying that he does not cover some of that stuff as he goes through in this sure. manner. Come up naturally. He's he's just not structuring it that way. So I don't know if that answers your question. That's pretty helpful. We were always given four different views on everything, and then you were left to pick your own view. And being young and immature, we get into big debates about it and come away with nothing, you know. Yeah. So to get to your question, Norm, let's uh, work through this next point here a little bit. So it's important to note that those taking Grace School of Bible today are seeing the same video that was shot when the classes were originally taught by Jordan in the mid-80s when it was first known as the PTC. So if, if you get these videos now... You're going to see goofy hair, terrible suits, major pocket protectors with 15 pens in the pocket, and all sort of the dorkiness of the 1980s. Okay? It's, it's there. It's the same as it was when it was originally filmed in the 1980s. And Richard would admit that. He also has, at the time, some sort of a terrible allergy. And there are multiple times, if you watch the classes, where he just has fits of sneezing. Uh, that go on sometimes for five minutes. Um, so you sort of get all the rawness that they had when they were filming it. And remember, all this is new to them at the time, so they're sort of learning on the fly. The school was not called Grace School of the Bible until after Jordan resigned his position at the Brilliant Bible Society in 1987 and struck out on his own. I... Brian Ross first began taking Grace School of Bible courses in the fall of 1997 while a student at Grace Bible College. I watched the entire first year of the school on the video equipment in the media room located in the basement of the Baltimore Library on the campus of Grace Bible College. So it was definitely an interesting situation. I was, I was having sent to the school the Richard's tapes. I am enrolled full-time as a student in Grace School of the Bible while I am watching Richard's tapes on the video equipment in the Baltimore Library. So I was sort of, to, answer, to get to your question, Norm, it was sort of a, a very first-hand comparison of different Grace perspectives. I was living in one, and while I was living in that one, I was receiving another one via video. And so I was sitting in the, in the courses of the college, I was, I was sitting in the basement watching these and looking at, you know, in, in sort of a very in-your-face sort of life way, what are the differences of perspective between the GGF and, and, and what Richard had to say. So 
I want to look at the next sentence. This was a deliberate decision on my part so that I could gain a multiplicity of perspectives on the grace message. Look, just speaking personally, I grew up in the grace message. My dad um, went to Richard School and graduated in 1987. He became pastor of the church in General City in about 19, sometime late 1990. And so, you know, I grew up through my teen years with an understanding that, you know, you, that, that you had Richard, you had Stam and the Bible Society, you had Grace Bible College and the GGF, and that they all sort of be believed similar things, but that they didn't always get along and didn't have the same perspectives on things. And so, one of the things I was kind of tired of was, was listening to the things that people were saying back and forth and realized that a lot, in many cases they were just repeating things that they had heard and there was a lot of things being said for which people really had no first-hand knowledge. And so, I, again speaking personally, I made the decision to get more than one perspective so that if it ever came to it and I had to speak about these things, I could speak on them from the point of view of experience. No, having seen that perspective and this perspective and being able to you know, weigh the options in my own mind more fairly than I perceived other people had been doing that, that I knew, okay? Um, yeah. Cool. Can I ask why your dad sent you to Grace Bible College in the first place? Or? My dad didn't really want me to go. Oh, okay. I mean, he, he wasn't going to stop me from going. But he, he didn't really he didn't really want me to what go. What was your goal to be a, te a, a teacher? No, that's a good that's a good question. My first goal was to go there to be to study to in their bachelor of theology program. Oh. Okay. And when I finished the first year, so that would have been that would have been uh, the school year of '96. I graduated from high school in 1996, so that would have been the '96-'97 school year. Okay. Um, in the summer of 97, which is when I turned 20, I went to, so I, I sat in GBC <coughs> classes for an entire school year. In the summer of 1997, I went with my dad to the Grace School of Bible Conference. That year it was in, um, at Trinity International Divinity School in Deerfield, Illinois. That's where Richard was, was, was having his conference that year. He rented the facility and, and sat there all week and, and heard the preaching. And just knew right away that what I was getting at the college was not what I was being exposed to sitting here and listening to the preaching. And so I, I, before I left the conference in the summer of 97, I filled out the forms, paid the registration fee, and signed up to take the school. And I started receiving the school tapes shortly after school started in September 97. But to go back, the original plan was to study for the ministry at Grace Bible College. But the summer of 97, this time in here, I decided I'm not going to do that. So then I went back in September 97, and the second plan was to study for uh, business administration. And I did that for a while and decided, no, nah, that's not going to work very good with the ministry. So then I switched again and decided that, that I wanted to, that I, what I needed to do was be a teacher. Because I knew that if I were a teacher, I would have weekends off, two weeks at Christmas, spring break, and an entire summer off, and it would afford me more opportunities to do ministry-related things. Okay, So my decision went from Bachelor of Theology to Business Administration. I did get an associate's degree in business. I did get enough credits in that field to get that associate's degree. And then finally, education. And I didn't, I didn't graduate, after all those changes, I didn't graduate with my bachelor's until 2002. Okay. So, but to answer your question, I did go there, Mike. I remember like it was yesterday. My parents were pulling it out of the parking lot, and my dad looked at me, and he just said, don't let them change you. And he drove off. I'm like, what's he talking about? <laughs> and uh, so then, by the end of that year, and in between the summer of my freshman and sophomore year, is when I decided to switch course. Fred? Yeah, your, your folks were here uh, maybe a couple of years ago, and I sat down with them at a table and uh, in the uh, fellowship room, and, and they basically they told me then that they were concerned when you picked it. It's Bible. Yeah, they were. They were uh, 
afraid that you might not come back the same. And uh, so, you know, just add to what Mike asked there. So that's sort of my story. So I'm 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 enrolled. Listen, I took I took every theology class at Grace Bible College that I could take. With without that that that. So all those elective areas, I lo I loaded them up with the Bible and theology classes. So about the only thing I didn't take there was Greek, um, and their their homiletics classes. The, the, their their uh, version of the, the preaching classes, and I, I was getting a lot of that eventually anyway when I entered the second year of uh, Grace School of Bible. So let's just go on with this, and this is sort of deteriorated into discussion about me, which well, neither here nor there, I guess. So this was a deliberate decision. Next point. When I graduated from Grace Bible College in 2002 with a Bachelor of Religious Education, I never... I never progressed beyond halfway through the second year of Grace School of Bible. I, I have finished the first year, and I'm, even to this day, I'm halfway through the second year of Grace School of Bible. I had never finished it. Okay. Um, trying to navigate the course load of both schools at the same time proved to be a great challenge. In addition, it was in the summer of 2000, at the age of 24, that I began preaching weekly at Westside Grace Church in Muskegon, Michigan while still trying to finish my education. So suffice it to say, family, ministry, and work demands on our time have never yet afforded me the, the time to complete Grace School of Bible. Um, mem before we leave that sentence, a couple comments there. It's a common thing, it's a common thing for those who take Grace School of Bible that by the time you get through the second year, you're off to ministry and you're so busy doing things that many people never come back and finish, just because they become so involved in act having their, in the ministry that they themselves are involved in, whether it's in their in, in their own assembly that they're already a part of, or in maybe going somewhere else, or, or starting their own ministry in some capacity. There's something about this math, this method and manner of study that Grace School of the Bible is based on that builds within you. Not only a capacity to understand the scriptures from the rightly divided uh, Pauline framework, but also produces a life in the student that just sort of can't help but express itself. Okay. Now I don't I don't know if that makes any sense to you or not, but that's the experience that I had, and that's the experience that a lot of others have had. So to finish this point, members of Grace Life Bible Church who are graduates of Grace School of Bible include Craig Holcomb, who is obviously a board member, and Ernie Skierbeck, who is uh, one of our Sunday School teachers here. So our assembly has benefited greatly having these men, who are graduates of Grace School of Bible, be a part of the work of the ministry with us. So it definitely, um, it's, it, it's definitely a unique situation. I also, just uh, for, uh, by way of information, I contacted the school and asked them how many total graduates have they had since the beginning, and they said they don't know. And I asked them how many school, how many are there, how many countries worldwide have Grace School of Bible affiliates in them? And they said again, ultimately, we don't know for sure, but they know there's some in, in uh, England, the Netherlands, South Africa, the Philippines. Um, one other Scandinavian country too. I can't remember which which one it is. Um, and so, at Canada, so there are other countries that have um, graduates of Grace School of Bible who have then taken that and established, you know, and sort of an outlet <coughs> school using the school tapes to train people in their own country using this system or this curriculum. So the total number of, of pastors or preachers that are out there <clears throat> worldwide that have gone through this material is virtually impossible to say for sure. Um, and that's partly because of the way it's being disseminated and distributed. There's a guy named uh, Johnny. He's from India. He goes to the Shorewood Bible Church in Chicago. And he's established, he's got, every, he's got it all online. 
And for a nominal fee, somebody in India can, can pay the registration fee and take the entire school right off the internet. So the, the, it's, it's really impossible to know for sure how many people have actually gone through the material and are now involved in some sort of, of ministry as a result of it. Fred? So there, there's really, there's no on-campus school. Everything is done by video. Yes. And are any of the, are, has any of it been translated into different languages? Some of it has. There's a, uh, the, the, fun of the FOD, Foundations of Dispensationalism, um, has been translated into Spanish at least. Um, I know that. And portions of other, of some of the other classes have also been um, put in other languages. I don't know how many. Um, but yeah, that, that's been done to some degree. So the, the, the tapes go out with him, like say somebody, you said somebody from India, the tapes go out with, with him still in his 1980s. Yep. <laughs> but it's being translated, but it's translated into a, say that. What I don't, oh, okay, I misunderstood. Anything that's been translated is in print form, oh, okay. not in video form. So any, anything that's anything in video form is still in English, to my knowledge. You know, I'm sure somebody's going to send me a message saying, "No, I've got school tapes in Spanish," or I, but, I, but I don't I don't think that's happened. But some of the some of the stuff from the school has been taken from student notes and then transcribed and translated into other languages. So I have at home a booklet called Foundations of Dispensationalism, which is basically. A student who took the class took voluminous, copious notes of everything that was taught and then basically put them into a booklet form. So if I, if I, maybe I'll bring that in next Sunday. If I were to grab that, it's just basically, oh, just a, basically a, a written transcript of the class that you could read. That and a few other things have been put in other forms. That right division chart is in at least four or five languages. It's in Spanish, it's in Dutch. Um, I think beyond that, I, I'm not totally sure, but I know it's in at least four or five different languages. Yeah. Are you familiar with Les Feldick's ministry? Yeah, I, know, I, I, I don't know. I, I'm familiar with the ministry, I don't know him personally. I just wondered how much difference there is in the, their approach. There's, there's, there's some difference. Mm -hmm. Um, in, in detail of belief, for sure. Um, but, look, I, I would argue that in the last 30 years, more people have come into contact with mid acts Pauline Dispensationalism via the ministries of Les Felick and Richard Jordan than any of the institutional centers of the Grace Movement combined. Amen. Right. Okay. Um, whatever, their, whatever, whatever Jordan and Felix disagreements are, more people have been exposed to, you know, dispensational Bible study from a Pauline viewpoint through those men's ministries than, you know, than anything that's going on in the academic centers. Any other questions about this? Because we're kind of in an awkward spot where we don't really have time to start the next point, um, but we still have some time to uh, possibly... Yes, Mike. Can I ask, just uh, in your interview with, with uh, Richard, did he mention anything about being influenced by Robert Thiem at all from Baraka Church in Houston, Texas? I've noticed some of his terminology, and I know some other Grace pastors use some of his unique terminologies like uh, edification, Pauline design for edification. Thiem used to teach the edification complex of the soul. He had come up with real complex, sophisticated, uh, names for everything, and I noticed a lot of these grace pastors pick up on some of that, and he, all, he had a, a worldwide tape ministry that uh, a lot of people listened to in the 70s particularly. He, was really he, mentioned, he mentioned the name R.B. Thiem, okay. but uh, to what specific reference he made, he did not, he wasn't real clear on. But he would not agree with his doctrine, but right. his methodology he probably he, 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 he does know. Influential. He does know who he is, and he mentioned okay. the name, but he did not mention it in a very specific manner that I can really I say much beyond this. Yeah. Lee? Oh, oh okay. Tom? Yeah, I, 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 I
where is Stan in all this and the early days of, of this great school of the Bible and what promotion is being done in the BBF materials, if any, with Richard being that editor? I don't know. I don't think there's necessarily any promotion of the PTC at the time in the searchlight. Okay. Um, Stan was at least initially supportive enough to say, yeah, go ahead and do it. And what, what's, what's interesting, what happened, what I perceived to happen, Tom, and we'll, I'll touch more on this later, is Richard, when he shows up in Chicago, he's, he's in his 30s, okay? So he's sort of young energy, if you will. And the, if you, I have a transcript from a speech that uh, Stan gave at the 1988 Cedar Lake Bible Conference, in which he references the recent increase in the number and the amount of interest in the grace message amongst young people. Okay? I personally attribute all of that to Richard's ministry. Richard was going out. He was having these regional meetings. He was, you know, people began to come to him. And I think that what ends up happening is, you know, a pretty a phenomenon where eventually Richard is beginning to surpass Eclipse Sam in terms of, you know, um, the perceived status, if you will. And I question whether or not Stam dealt with that very well. But I do think that, that he definitely was, his influence in the, in the you know, early to mid-80s was largely responsible for a groundswell of younger people into, you know, into that message. And it's in one of these points, he says that by the end, the last year he went to the Cedar Lake Conference, there were 60 men that were at that conference as a result of being involved with him in the, in the, in the PTC. Now remember, now it's out on video, you, so you have that original class of about six guys, you have that original class, and then now you got it disseminated all these guys that are now in the, in the class via the video, and he's, he's promoting amongst the class, hey, you guys need to come to, the, you need to, come to this conference. And so he says that the last, the last conference he was at, Cedar Lake, which would have been in 1987, I believe, there were at least 60 guys that were at that conference as a result of being there and touched in some way through Richard's ministry to him. Not really staying. Okay. Please. Ah, and considering the expansion and the youth issue, I don't know whether you know it, but I think probably you can attribute a measure of influence from the Richard Jordan group for this thing called Generation Next. And this is our fourth year of being involved with that. And we've got uh, unmarried kids, about 50 of them from all over the United States, we gather for three days. It's just a wonderful. And uh, I know that uh, Hannah McMichael, she married uh, Ted Fellow's son. And so we've got kids uh, involved from uh, from uh, Fink's group, and of course a tradition, the old GGF from uh, David Adams. So we have about 50 unmarried, it's for not high school, but mostly for college age young people. And we're having our fourth conference now, uh, July or June 6th through the 8th at our new couple camp. So I'd love to have you all promote that for the kids, but it's strictly focused on uh, sound dispensational teaching. It's great. The kids do all the teaching. Mm -hmm. Fred, and then we'll work on it. Yeah, one of the things that just kind of is hitting me here is that, go back to our studies uh, a couple years ago with Darby, how he got, he had this time where he was set aside and he had this in-depth personal study of the scriptures, and uh, I think that's where Les Feldick came from, his own personal, you know, in-depth studies of the scriptures, and Richard, uh, when he was a young person, first saved, he had that 
unquenchable desire to, you know, to get into the scriptures. And so all their training came directly from their personal study of the scriptures, not from, like you said before, not from uh, other theologians and so forth like that. And uh, to me, that's the power of the Word of God, you know, and the ministry of the Holy Spirit in the individual life to uh, bring about the instruction that that we... I know what happened in me, Fred, when I started t when I started going through the school because wh what I was doing what I, what I was doing here at the college was I was studying theology. Studying, I wasn't studying the Bible. Studying other stuff. Yeah. I was studying what everyone else said about the Bible, right. but I wasn't actually studying the Bible. And the thing the thing that works effectually in you that believe is the Scripture, not you know Francis Schaeffer or who for whatever good they did. Okay. I'm not trying to diminish that because they did some important things and, and so on. But what the, the power of the life is not in those books. It's in the Scripture. And so what, what, what I was referring to, most people that take the school by the middle of the second year, they're out doing something. It's because it's not just a bunch of sort of mental gymnastics that you play with the Scriptures or theology. It's, it, 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 it's the way that he does it is he's building within you a capacity to a life, really, I guess, is the yeah. way to put it. Well, when you, it's so noticeable, too, when you listen to a lot of different preachers. I do that a lot because I travel and I'd rather listen to somebody preach than to listen to something else. And, uh, you know, most preaching is a, is a uh, repetition of what they've learned in school. You know, I mean, no matter what denominational background they might come from, you can what they're getting, what you're, what they're expounding is what they've been taught in school. And what I like, what I, the thing about this is, you can expound the scriptures because if you've been taught in the scriptures or taught from the, by the Holy Spirit from studying the scriptures, you're going to expound the scriptures, right? Not just what you've been taught in school. And you're going to and, and you're going to learn how to do that. Yeah. So that's that's part of that's part of that focus on the preaching. Um, Mike, was your hand up? I, I was just wondering if there's any connection with the, with uh, Stam and Sandler starting their school in Germantown uh, about the same time this school started. Uh, any connection with that? Um, um, yeah. Ultimately, I don't know the answer to that. I. I I'm sure that they're related to some degree, um, because you know that that would give them their own training center. The GGF has theirs here with Grace Bible mm -hmm. College. Richard's kind of doing his own thing with the the video. And the th the thing about the video is that it was so far ahead of its time, because now everything is done how yeah. on video. Nobody the the brick and mortar college and university is falling down. Is there we are. We're living in the decline of that model of education because of the technology. Now, Richard would say he didn't know this. He didn't know any of this when he did it. He just sort of went and did what he did, and it ended up being what it is, you know. And it uh, sort of uh, some accidental things, some mis mistakes along the way, people coming along and helping, and you know, it just sort of became. You know what it is, but it was it was never set out to. There, there was never an intentionality. The only intentionality behind it was I'm going to teach that. I'm going to. That's what I think men in the ministry need to have. That's what I benefited from. I'm going to teach that, and whatever came as a result is just sort of the, you know, the fruit of that ministry and the other and the people that he was teaching. And Beverly, was your hand up? Okay. Well, we didn't get through everything yet again, but um, hopefully, hopefully you're finding this stuff to be uh, beneficial. So we're, we're gonna, what I'm going to do then is I'm going to take this last point and I'm going to drop it down into the next notes. Okay. So when we come back next week, we're going to pick up with the grace alternatives. All right. Any questions? Uh, I appreciate your attention. It is 10 o'clock, so we will quit and uh, see everyone next week, weather willing. Okay.